Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ancient Warfare Podcast. Um, my name is Jasper Ortaus. I'm the editor of Ancient Warfare Magazine. And with me today are Mark DeSantis, Mark McCaffrey, Murray Dam, Mike Cole, and Lindsay Powell. Um, we haven't got an issue to, to discuss today, but since it's still the middle of summer, um, we thought we might discuss about some things that you might like to read about Ancient Warfare that are... Mm, Maybe somewhat easier for consumption than some academic books might be. Although I would totally expect this crowd to go, oh, I've loaded my my vacation beach time reading with uh, several ancient sources and something with more footnotes than, than there are actually pages in the book. Um, but uh, how many, uh, what, what, what do you like to read when you read ancient fiction? What, what do you like to read? Who would like to start with that? Well, Suetonius jumps to mind when you want to read <laughs> it. Um, but, but, um, of course. Thank yeah, you, Mark. Exactly. Nice. Um, Xen Xenophon Selenica. Ooh, nice call. Well, Absolutely. Well, it, it, um, we're and we're going Historia right Augusta. into source critique. <laughs> if we're it starting off with Historia Augusta, it really would have to be. Well, well that's true. That's true. Well, Procopius. No. Anyway, I think when we're <laughs> coming to the topic that we're talking about, um, ancient warfare fiction is is niche within niche within niche, really. You know, ancient world fiction is is rare enough. Um, for me, ancient world fiction, probably the greatest writer of ancient world fiction is still Mary Renault, um, who, you know, in her own day, people didn't believe she was a woman writing about Alexander the Great, but she also wrote about other aspects of the ancient world. And interestingly, warfare doesn't feature, even though she's writing about Alexander the Great, she's writing about the Peloponnesian War, she's writing about personalities interacting much more than, than you know, battlefield logistics and things like that. So for me, when you're looking at battlefield and, and warfare fiction, uh, there's some quite surprising uh, texts, um, which which are really great reads, which we'll get onto about what makes a great ancient warfare read. Um, for me, Tom Holt's The Walled Orchard, uh, which is about the poet Eupolis of Athens going to um, the Sicilian campaign during the Peloponnesian War is, is amazing. One of the reviews of it talks about, um, you know, one day I'll be there when they mention great ancient warfare fiction or great ancient world fiction and Tom Holt gets mentioned. Um, and then the other one I came across more recently is a guy named Alfred Duggan, who the, the blurbs on his books talk about that he's the greatest ancient fiction writer the world's ever known. You're like, I've never heard of him. Um, but he basically wrote 15 novels, um, having retired from a, a career in banking. Um, and so he's got both medieval and ancient, but some of them are quite remarkable because he talks about um, late Roman Britain warfare. Um, he talks about the soldiers of um, Crassus who are captured at Cari. Uh, he's got some of the successor uh, emperors. He's got a, he wrote a, both a novel and a nonfiction book on Mithridates um, called, I think the nonfiction book's called The Poison King. Um, but there's, you know, he's got a book on the, the, the first triumvirate called Three's Company. Um, so in many ways, Duggan's well ahead of his time writing in the forties and fifties. Um, it's, it's but those, those are, are really interesting. Just uh, jump in because, um, he, he's one of those authors that, um, I, I grew up on, uh, and I read probably nearly all of them. In fact, uh, my, my great frustration was I was actually staying in a hotel and I had that one about the one you mentioned about the uh, the, the Gallic warriors going off and getting, getting lost in, in Crassus' war. And I left it in the hotel room <laughs> for years and years oh. and years and years. I wanted oh. to get a copy just to read the last couple of chapters. But the point I was going to make is that he went out of vogue, that the, the publishers mm. didn't publish his work anymore. And about uh, eight years ago, I forget which, which publisher it was, uh, rediscovered him and started putting his books out again uh, in paperback and also in Kindle. Yeah, because he, he was out of print forever. That's right. So I think what, what's very interesting, uh, we're all slightly different ages. It's going to be interesting to see what, what titles we pick up. But I think um, we, we must be cognizant that there are fads and fashions in, in, in historical writing. Um, so, so some authors are rediscovered. And I'm delighted that you mentioned mm -hmm. Alfred Duggan because he's one of those. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, I think that one of the things, as so often in discussions of ancient warfare, even now, is people talk about um, John Keegan's face of battle. 
as being a the the watershed book that changed fiction as well as non-fiction um you know and i think when you look at something and i know someone else is going to talk about um pressfield's uh gates of fire and and even tides of war um which is his follow-up book about the peloponnesian war um whereas gates of fire is about the battle of thermopylae that's very much a face of battle kind of novel it's very much a in the um, in the middle of the phalanx fighting, you know, broken dory and all sorts of things. Uh, whereas earlier books are very logistical. I mean, is it Imperial Governor um, about about Britain? And it's basically about which units get moved where, and <laughs> you just get lost as to as to which units moving there. So I think it's it's exactly that. The tastes change, and it's um, the face of battle is in comparison to the personalities involved. I mean. I really enjoyed uh, both Creation and Julian by um, Gore Vidal. And, you know, those are not nitty-gritty in the battle. They've, they've got much more going on about them. And and even Mary Renault's books, that you know, the, the warfare is, is, a, is a minuscule part of what makes them great fiction. Um, this is the thing, uh, um, uh, Murray, I think that's really that you brought up that's super, super important. I, I'm, I don't know if uh, ancient warfare listeners know I am a professional novelist too outside of uh, my history work and the, the thing that I've discovered in novel writing which I think you'll probably all agree is that what makes good novels is characters that's really what makes it the only thing in the world I think that's really interesting is other people and I think most novelists will agree on that and and so warfare itself the tactics of warfare the arms and equipment um, that stuff is really fascinating and it's good as window dressing but when you're doing a, a dramatic work, which is what fiction is, it's not going to carry the story. What's going to carry the story is compelling characters and how those characters interact. If you, if you, and yet it's remarkable how many people try to do that. <laughs> right, right. I mean, look, I don't know if any of you have read Warhammer 40K fiction uh, that Black Library produces. Um, I certainly have read a, read a lot of it. It's, it's, it's it, it rivals it rivals um, Harlequin with their uh, Mills and Boone romance novels. I mean, it's, it's super successful. Output. It's super successful, but. <laughs> Um, it, it has a limited audience, right? Um, it, it's only so far you can go with it because, and it's because it does that. I mean, the, the characters are all necessarily kind of wooden, but you bring up Mary Renault as this great example are these richly, richly imagined characters. And I think the other thing that Mary Renault does that was really groundbreaking is her frank treatment of homosexuality, which is, which at the time she was writing, I mean, it's groundbreaking even for now, but at the time she mm. was writing, it was amazing. I mean, the last of the line is this deeply moving love story between men. And um, <clears throat> and in that way, it's 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 really cool because there's a lot of debate about homosexuality in the ancient world, and she's able to tackle that debate in fiction in mm. a way that nonfiction writers, you know, yeah. can't can't do. And that's why the response of the time was: this cannot be a woman. This must be a pseudonym right. for a man well, writing about a love story right. between men. Right. You know. Right. So what's even more remarkable? It's not actually a story between uh, two men. It's a man and a boy. So it's actually in that fascinating area of taboo. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm. You're talking about a servile relationship between basically, a, a, is it a eunuch uh, who's 13, 14, um, and a man in his late 20s and 30s. That, that opens up all sorts of areas. I would actually wonder whether that book could actually be published today uh, without a great deal of um, sort of uh, gnashing of editorial mm. teeth. Uh, and the yeah. same way with uh, Marguerite uh, Jochenard, uh, Hadrian, Memoir de Rion, which, which, which tackles a similar sort of subject with uh, Antinous and, and Hadrian. And, and, and she had, Jokana seems to have the same uh, ability as a writer to explore the mind space of, of, of a lover with, with, with somebody else. And, and th those two books, by the way, have lived with me forever for that reason. They, they just mm. are so compelling uh, to, that they explore an emotional space that as a non-fiction writer, I can't go into. I, I can't really delve. I'm, I'm writing, you know, uh, finishing my book about uh, Barkhofer and, and, and Hadrian. Uh, and I, I actually ironically mentioned Jochen in, in, in that because it, it was a, uh, one of my inspirations. But um, I, I have to stick to facts. I, I have to sort of mm. take the facts and, and follow the clues where they go. I can't, I can't sort of speculate. Uh, but that's the joy of a novelist and someone like... Uh, like, like you, Mike, you, you have that, uh, I suppose, wonderful gift that you can go there and do it. I, I, I don't have that gift. I did have a footnote once with uh, Gore Vidal's creation in it, um, 
my uh, and my quote was i've never met an inveterate liar who doesn't wax lyrical about the value of truth i'm like oh my god that's amazing um and well you, well, you know what they was, say about texans you can't be a texan unless you can tell a tall tale yeah so well, it was, always, but it was but, about source analysis you know that that, that we've got all these sources that talk about truth and it's like yeah but they're lying just be before we go on, I mean, the, the, the authors and the titles trip of the tongue real quick here uh, for the, for the um, um, people who are listening. Um, Angus, our, our um, engineering wizard, is trying to keep a list of everything that we suggest <laughs> so, so that we can put it on the, on the show notes and you don't have to try to do it yourself. Yeah, thanks for the French titles there, uh, Lindsay. <laughs> so, so, yeah, though, sorry, yeah. I interrupted. <laughs> Mike, what were you? You was. I was just going to say me. that um, um, the best narrative history has this in common with fiction, um, and that one of the things ancient warfare does well, one of the thing Osprey books do, do well, one of the things that you know the Tom Hollands and the um, Jennifer Robertses of the world do really well is that they emphasize dramatic narrative as having value in history. And that's something taken right from the novelists. When, when, when myself and, and my mentor and colleague and dear friend, Michael Livingston, who some of your AW listeners who also read MW may be familiar with from his work there, we always are trying to emphasize the dramatic narrative and we're not ashamed of that. And we take that from our, um, from our novel writing is that you have a baseline in scholarship. You have to be accurate, right? You can't, you can't tell lies. You can't distort the sources. But emphasizing the drama of a story and bringing that story to the fore, to the fore in history is a way of engaging readership and making sure you're going to have mass appeal. Look, and this is the thing I always go back to, is that how many people read Clio, right? How many people read the Journal of American Archaeology? How many people read um, Phoenix? You know, um, they're doing groundbreaking research, but they're reaching a very small audience. Sorry, we have a, a dog barking here. Um, and uh, um, emphasizing that dramatic narrative, taking that from fiction, I think really does help have mass appeal. And I think that's what we've all tried to do uh, here. So I, I, I think there's a lot of value to historians in reading the historical fiction is my point. But I think it's a fine line. I mean, that, that there is a thing, uh, narrative history uh, and there's storytelling where, where sort of people fill in the gaps with, with their own thoughts. And it, it's very interesting when historians start critiquing each other's works because you, you they, they go into those forbidden areas of you may die up uh, and and somebody was it was you Murray right at the start talk, talked about in a sense it, history is a sort of storytelling art where some part of it's fabricated uh, and, and we, we we thrive on ancient material don't we and of course you look at Herodotus or Tacitus and so on and I live in the world of Tacitus and Cassius Dio a lot and I'm forever reading uh, journals where, where people are trying to literally forensically establish, is that true? Um, and and, and, and the, the, the problem is, in a sense, is that are we dealing with historians or are we dealing with storytellers in a, in a more pure mm. sense of telling stories? Because there's, a, there's, a, there's an angle that they want to communicate. And I think the difference between uh, uh, where, where that is and a, and, a, and a novelist is that there is, there is no uh, pretense. I mean, you're, you're telling a story. You, you, you have the luxury of being able to invent the characters and create the storyline, or as, as novelists tell me, they invent the characters and the characters go off on a story and their job is to write it down, um, something I can't do. Um, <laughs> I have to have much more uh, control over things than that. But um, it, it really comes back to the, everything that we talk about in these, these ancient world podcasts, we usually talk about the sources and, and we sort of frown and gnash our teeth because we complain that they, they're not very accurate. So, but that's what you deal with. But isn't it fascinating that, you know, non-fiction writers have to at some point in a sense deal with fictions in order to make our history yeah mm. but in the, that line that you're talking about being very narrow i mean it's, it's interesting sort of look, looking at some authors that are being labeled as uh, fiction writers and some that are being labeled as uh, you know non-fiction and actually saying well how much of the source is uh, you know uh, is each actually being is actually being used by each? You know, my favourite is Robert Harris in terms of his Cicero trilogy, and one of the you know the, his great success in that trilogy is the fact that he intertwines the actual historical sources into his fictional narrative, 
and it, it works and it really gives it that that depth but at the same time the ac accuracy that you know people like us are going to, to appreciate but somebody just reading it for a fictional uh, novel is going to find that you know it flows even you know even better as such but then you know there's one book that i've, I've still got on my shelf here that um i read years ago uh the last roman can't remember who it was by it's um looking at the um the life of romulus augustus and of course you know anybody who's looked at the life of romulus augustus knows that there's actually not much on him and yet this you know i, I picked up this book originally you know thinking oh somebody you know got something you know, to be able to tease out something you know more detailed and whatnot i've gone through it and it's it's literally a, a work of fiction based around about eight facts from the historical sources and it's, it's just interesting how these things get, you know, as I say, the label on these guys, whether they're fiction, whether they're history. Um, I think it's, you know, it's in the proof of the pudding in terms of the reading that we actually can determine that sometimes. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And, and um, to some degree, storytelling is about entertaining, isn't it? I mean, it, it goes mm. back to the old idea that, you know, the guy would would sit with people around a fire and you, you tell the hunting story of the day and then it become legend and people would pass that story down down. Mm. That, that we resonate and we respond to stories. In fact, well, one thing that was actually fascinating when I used to work uh, for a big corporation, that there were fads and fashions how you give presentations. And one of the fads was you need to tell stories. And you, you do that mm. by sort of, it, you, instead of saying slide one problem, slide two solution, You'd actually start with, you know, you went to talk to a customer and they told you all these things. And, so, and you, you, you actually absorb people in the story world that you created. Um, and, and I think what, what's so satisfying in a sense about reading novels is that you can surrender to that. You, you can just be entertained at a very, very fundamental level. You, you, you just get transported. And, and, a, and a great writer, and, and I've got several books that I chose, um, have the ability to do that very easily. Um, the, the, the shame is that there are a great many who probably don't quite have that skill and you've got to read an awful lot to find the good ones. Uh, one other point I wanted to make was um, internality, um, you know, human internality. So my, my book, The Bronze Lie, is coming out uh, September 7th and it's sort of defanging these myths about who the Spartans were. And one of the points I make in the book is that when we hold up the myth of Spartans as the greatest the super warriors that we know they were not, that we are committing two crimes. The first crime is against history because we're not telling the truth. The second crime is against ourselves because we're robbing ourselves of the, uh, of the chance to identify with the Spartans as human beings and be inspired by them and feel connected to them. And that's a really good point for history writ large and one that comes from novels. So um, I was gonna nominate Robert Graves. I don't think we've mentioned Robert Graves yet, both his Count Belisarius and his um, I, Claudius and Claudius the God, of course as being you know, great examples of fiction. But the thing that's so incredibly useful about that is that it allows the reader to, to think about the internality of the experience of being Claudius, right? Like, what is that like? Um, and if that's not something you're gonna get from the sources because there are some examples of, of uh, where they talk about internality and emotionality in sources. But in terms of extrapolating the, 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 either the quotidian or the dramatic reality of what it means to be an emperor of Rome, that is a thing that has to be speculated on. It can be derived from the sources, but speculation is necessary. And it is in that speculation that we create the sense of a human being that a reader and a member of an audience can feel connected to and inspired by. And that's, and that's of critical value, both in historical fiction and in narrative history, but really in historical fiction is where we can make it come alive. Mm. I think, I mean, yeah. one of the, I think the interesting thing for me, I mean, I love a good historical note. I don't want a paragraph. I want, I want pages and pages yeah, of, yeah. of analysis <laughs> of where the inspiration came from, which I think for a start, that kind of historical note informs me of the writer's ability as a historian, um, you know, setting aside their ability to draw a line under what we know or what we think we know, and then make the rest up informed decisions on the characters um but it's also you know it, it tells you where where that stuff has come from um and you know reading some of the sources especially the contradictory ones you know with with fourth century bc history where you've got a contradiction between the hellenica of xenophon and diodorus for instance and plutarch later you're often dealing with a contradiction not a not a 
a nuanced version of the same thing. It's like, no, no, they disagree on who this person was, what their motivation was, what they did, when they did it, where they went. Um, so those sorts of things from a historian's perspective are a, a, a right logjam. Um, whereas the novelist can navigate a way through them that the historian can't. And for me, that's that's a great value. As long as you know that this is a speculative invention of what might have happened uh, and leave that aside. So for me, that's not a... Um, in a way that's not a, a contradiction in terms because it's often there in our sources. And, you know, there's a, um, a a section in the late Roman period that really fascinates me about the career of an incredibly obscure um, figure named Festus of um, Tridentum. And we've got three eyewitnesses to his life and they contradict each other. You're like, hang on, all three of you knew this guy and yet all three <laughs> of you's version of him doesn't correspond to one another. It's basically they're writing fiction about someone who they all knew. And then someone else has come along going, well, I'm going to write another piece of fiction about the same person that completely contradicts what you're saying um, and is my version of this person. And so, you know, in a way, the all history is fiction. Um, and in another way, you've got that problem that you mentioned, Lindsay, about the idea of what is the truth and, and that problem of, well, exactly what is the truth this is a philosophical debate and so fiction in a way enters into that because when you're sometimes dealing with source material that we must rely on we must trust it but sometimes you then get a, a picture and an image that says you can't trust your source material well, which so, you know so, uh, completely de-anchors you the, the, the book that i just literally reviewed for uh, ancient history magazine i know it's a sister publication but it's germane here uh, James M. Banner wrote a book about revisionism in history. And um, the, the final kind of conclusion he comes to is that really what we as historians try to do, we try to capture the past. And it's an almost impossible thing because, I mean, what does that even mean? Um, so, for example, you could say, well, I will uh, try and capture, for example, our last year. For example, how on earth you capture 2019, 2020 and now in terms of the world of COVID? You've got documents, you've got newsreels, you've got interviews you can do. You will always see it through a set of eyes which you as the author, you select material. And it's mm. the selection which makes your history unique to you as the writer. Um, in exactly the same way that a, a novelist will do in, 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 in populating their partly imagined world, but also presumably is, is based on some sort of notion of reality, make it grounded in history. Um, so what it means is that the, that, the, that the problem that you have as being an historian is that you know, even before you've put your pen on paper, you are filtering, you are sifting, you're editorializing about materials that are going to tell your story, because ultimately that's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. the, the difference is, and we've said this, and for example, the, the, I mentioned uh, Marguerite Yocanar and the memories of Memoir of Hadrian, was that what, what she was able to do marvelously was, was inhabit the mind of, frankly, a man I don't terribly like. I, I know a lot of people would be shocked by that, but Hadrian I don't think is a terribly likable man. Um, you know, arrogant, um, sort of disciplinarian, uh, micromanager, cruel in lots of ways, and he was pretty mean to his friends as well. Um, but but she is makes that, him a is likeable that, is character. That the, is that the fictional or the historical? <laughs> well, well, that's a very good point because <laughs> guess what? We only have the story Augusta, mm. which is actually some people would actually say that's satirical. It's not actually bi biographic; it's satirical. Yeah. Uh, and as I was writing my, my new book, um, I, I was very aware of that. I, you know, I quote extracts from it thinking, should I actually say, by the way, I think that's intended as a joke. Mm -hmm. um, so I left it to the author, to, to, to the reader to, to, to make their own conclusions about that. But what I think what she did beautifully was she, she got into the skin of this person at an emotional level, which I, I certainly couldn't do from, from reading the story of Augusta, but she was able to do it. Um, mm. And and it was it's beautifully written, and that's why it stood the test of time. I mean, this book was written when in the fifties, sixties, or something. Yeah, uh, been translated into many, many, many languages. It was originally written in French, as you know, and it was her uh, her lover um, who actually translated it into English. It, it, it works so well. Um, but yes, I, I, I envy the the the, the, the novelists they can do that because I struggle as an historian. I always how far to go. I always, you know, had students when I was teaching who would, you know, they were wanting what happened. They, you know, what happened? Mm -hmm. Tell me what happened. We're like, you know, and even now the, the, the dreaded phrase is, well, we don't know. And we have that phrase in the back of our minds so often. Um, you know, and when someone asks us something as a, as a historian, generally we will preface it with all sorts of caveats rather than, well, this happened. 
you know, um, you know, well, will we think? And some people argue. And I think the fascinating thing, thing for me is that as an ancient historian, much more, in fact, than than a lot of modern historians, and I'm, I apologize to modern historians, um, that that we're willing to say well, we don't know and be comfortable with that and go, well, you know, there's there's all sorts of options on the table. But I talk to my students about, well, you know, take the history of a divorce. You are going to get the same set of material, the same events, the same chronology presented to you from entirely contradictory perspectives based on whether you're dealing with the which spouse you're dealing with um you know and i you know and they're like oh wow yeah right and i'm like and take the assassination of jfk we filmed it and we still don't know what happened yeah so yeah. you know from that perspective the the line between historical fiction speculation and historical speculation actually isn't far apart at all they're, they're they're very close together um and you know and, and not not getting into the conspiracy theory because you know a lot of novel a lot of novels are based on some kind of conspiracy theory around silence or around around contradiction of sources and you know do we really know and, and who is this real person really and how could someone do that um and it's an interesting one because you know uh mike was talking before about character 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 and yet for me there's three types of fiction um in general and the, there are the ones that are based on character which are the ones that are my favorite there are the ones which are based on plot um which you know again these kind of wooden characters who go through things and things happen um which some people love and that's fine uh and then the third one is world fiction where people just want to be in the world they want to spend time in the world and in the places of the world um and you know have vast passages of descriptive material about a forest or a, or a building it's Tolkien. you're describing Tolkien. well well but i think the the interesting thing there is that the the characters can sometimes transcend that and people can make interesting characters and again I, uh, Tolkien is very for me it's like the characters in Tolkien are not that compelling but they've been made compelling through the setting and the backstory you know the the the, the, you, you can pull the mythology the mythology yeah. that that Tolkien has created for his world creates interesting things whereas for me you know uh Gimli and Legolas are not a compelling story of a friendship it's a fragmentary oh, no, thank you Mari. now you ruined the podcast <laughs> I now have not have ruined the podcast people go going I no, no 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 I love Tolkien I love Tolkien but but it's not it's not a character based it's not no, a no, character based just, I was right. just going to pull it, Murray, pull it Murray back is absolutely right Mary's absolutely right and I just want to throw in one thing in support of his because uh, listeners need to know the most interesting characters in all of J.R.R. Tolkien's books, and I do mean all, I'm including the Silmarillion and Lost Tales, are two orcs standing guard outside Barad Dur, and one turns to <laughs> the other one and goes, I tell you, it's no game working down in the city. What about them? Like, they're the most interesting. That was such a quintessential, like, involved in human moment. You know, as opposed to Frodo Baggins, whose worst character flaws being excessively earnest. Mur Murray has the right of it. I was going to say, because we were, you know, back to ancient fiction. Oh, right. But what Mark was saying, um, you can see that you can, we can sort of, if you think about it, you can think of examples of each of those categories. And maybe like, um, was it Lindsay Davis? Yes. Um, you know, the detective. Mm -hmm. That is, I Falco. think that's just, that's, yeah, Falco. He's just, he's just running. Rome is the backdrop. And you have a story about him and his wife and his adventures. And he he sometimes he meets Vespasian at one point, I think. Um, and historical things happen, but they're very much sort of the background. And we picked a character who is, you know, uh, not going to occur in the sources otherwise. And then there are books like uh, Murray already mentioned, say Stephen Pressfield's um, Gates of Fire, which very much puts you. Uh, you know, is a, is one of the characters at Thermopylae, and we're trying to see what happened. The battle, you know, a, a well, well, a known event, not a, a famous event, and you see it through his eyes. And then there's examples such as um, maybe Harry Sidebottom's uh, books about um, Ballista. Yeah, Ballista, um, which is you know he knows a lot about the mid third century. But a lot of it is in, un, uh, uncertain, so he can sort of fill things in and put a person 
in a fairly high up position um, to have adventures in an area that there's sort of just enough known about what the what what might have happened, but he can fill in all kinds of blanks, which is an interesting thing to do. Well, one of the books that I, I like and uh, that, that I'll mention is Eagle in the Snow by Wallace Bream, and it is absolutely not historically correct at all. But what what I'll tell you <laughs> is this. When, when I put the book down, and I put that book down 20 years ago, it haunts me still. Mm. That, that there was mm. something that that author did in, in telling the story about the last days of the Roman Empire in the West, which was shocking. Um, and in fact, uh, I think what, what this tells you is the power of the novelist to be able to create a mood and, and a sense of reality. And again, it's, it's, a, it's all in the head. It's all the imagination. Uh, and it can be so compelling that when you put the, the, the book down, you're actually really quite upset. How on earth could mm. this happen? Mm. You get quite angry. Mm. Uh, the, the only yeah, thing I've creation. actually... Uh, yeah. My, yeah, so for example, I, uh, I have a similar experience. Whenever I write a biography about someone, I actually... It's funny, I, I did this about Marcus Agrippa uh, several years ago. And there's a scene where I basically describe that he dies. We don't quite know how he died, we just know he did. And I wrote on Twitter uh, I, I, that, uh, you know, I just, I just basically described how he died. And Tom Holland, the historian, commented, yes, I exactly understand what you mean. And there's this sense of loss, mm. to put it very bluntly. I mean, th th this person has lived in, in your imagination. You've, you've described their living days, and suddenly they're not living anymore. And now the mood has changed. Your writing will change now because you're writing a retrospective. And that's how I think a good novel should be as well. It should leave me feeling something. I, I, I should feel emotionally moved by it. Mm. Mm. Well, I think I think it, it, Wallace Bream is interesting because the history at the time was that the Rhine froze, and that's what allowed barbarians to just spoiler, walk over. Spoiler. And well, sorry, yes, yeah, spoiler alert. If you were going to read, Imper oh, whoops, yeah, Empire. Oh, sorry, everyone. Um, but that's interesting because, of course, history has moved forward from that, and that's like no longer the the historical perspective of that period. And yet, when he wrote, that was the understanding. So I think there's an interesting hand in handness of historical understanding and novel novelizations of that historical understanding. Um, and so there's a really interesting, we were talking about Mary Renault earlier. There's a, there's a really interesting thing with some novels that transcend time as, as great novels have always done. And then other novels, which are of their time. Um, you know, we, we mentioned briefly Stephen Pressfield. And it's interesting when you start to read how many novels set in the ancient world, Stephen Pressfield has written, um, and and even even Bag of Vance actually has this again spoiler alert mythological battle set in ancient Indian mythology that the movie version of it completely omitted. You know, we didn't get to see um, uh, you know the these characters in the movie suddenly battling in chariots with with lightning rods, but that's in the book. There's a metaphor in the book. Um, and you look at all of his other novels, Amazons and Tides of War and the Afghan campaign and um, Alexander, the, the Art of War. They're all ancient world uh, military based novels. Uh, and, you know, the action of what's going on in the warfare is central to all of those. Um, and I think that the, the, the advances in understanding the dynamics of ancient warfare have been central to being able to write that. Yeah, Pressfield, I think Pressfield, more than anybody, we talked earlier in our conversation about how if you overdo the warfare piece, you're going to kind of spoil the spoil the experience. But Pressfield is, I think, and possibly because, remember, Pressfield was a United States Marine, um, and he, I think, he, he manages to weave warfare into the internality of the human experience so well. The best example of this for me is the Afghan campaign. He just does world-weary veterans. His character of Polamides in um, Tides of War, which is his sort of send up of Alcibiades, um, he really captures the, the veteran experience. Uh, and it's very clear that he's channeling his own experience. Um, as a counterpoint to that, and um, Murray, had, you had mentioned books that are plot driven versus books that are character driven. Folks may disagree with me, but, but we, we can't end this podcast without mentioning Colleen McCullough's The First Man of, in Rome. <laughs> which yeah. is, Mm. which is really, you want to talk about a book that stands the test of time and that um, 
you know, it, it really is how I learned about Marius and Sulla, even before I read Plutarch. And by but the it, way, it is a heavy read, though. I mean, in terms of yeah, yeah. she got she goes overboard to mm. you know get every possible p detail in there, and sometimes reading it, you sort of think, is this chapter more about you making sure that we've covered all bases on all facts that you possibly have covered, or are we going to pick up the story at some point? Because right, it's so, so <laughs> yeah. it's not <laughs> one. People should perhaps know it's not just so, one book. It's like here's a, a little inside thousand yeah. page books. And here's a little inside, yeah. um, here's a little inside baseball from science fiction and fantasy novelists. When you are sort of cutting your teeth as a science fiction and fantasy novelist, you're you're at some point or another. Some pro directs you to read the Turkey City Lexicon, and your listeners, AW listeners, you can Google and read this. It's sort of like a uh, an informal list that over the years science fiction and fantasy writers have made of tropes, bad tropes in writing. And the one mm. mark that you're describing is called. I've suffered for my art, and now it's your turn. And that's when, <laughs> and that's when the writer, the writer, cannot resist. Because obviously, when you do research to write a novel, most of it has to not make it onto the page because it would make the book mm. too long and too boring. You have to do the research to inform your own writing, yeah. but you leave it out. And you're right, Mark. Colleen McCullough is mm. an example of someone who left it in. I mean, at it the same time, it's uh, oh, you know, I go back to Robert Harris again. You know, some of the details I read, you know, when I was reading his trilogy on Cicero, it was like I, I ended up going back to the sources and say, thinking, is that exactly what? Oh, yeah, it actually is. It's you know, mm. he he really it, it comes out in the reading that he's you know he really did do thorough research on every possible detail and it just comes out that little bit you know it's a little bit more fluent than you get in Colin McCulloch but mind you Colin I remember well, I think, the stories going around his favor is is that that, that that Robert Harris is actually a journalist by trade so, so yeah. he's used mm. to dealing with actual source material but he's got that wonderful pace right you know it's, mm. it's the, the, the difficulty with if you literally were to read all of his letters and all of his speeches you, you'd probably be brain dead at the end of it because it's kind of stupefying, isn't it? But oh, I don't know. Shackleton Bailey was 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 brilliant. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but 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 I think what what uh, what Harris has done is that in the space of what three relatively standard length novels. I mean, they're not they're not Colleen length novels. They're you know, <laughs> the standard two or three hundred pages. Um, that that he can, creates this world in which you feel sympathy for this man. Um, mm. I mean, through Tiro, isn't it? That through his secretary. Yeah, through and, through and, the secretary's slave. You read mm. about. So, so when you actually read about Cicero, again, going back to Hadrian, not a terribly likable man. I mean, they have very strong opinions about things. And Ooh, he's, he's we'll a argue over that later. <laughs> um, and, and what I think that uh, Robert Harris does, he creates a, a he he he, uh, he he creates a very sympathetic view of this man, and um, mm. he did it very well, brilliantly well. Yeah. Should be made into movie. The, the story that um, that used to go around about. Colleen McCulloch, who used to uh, come to a particular bookshop in Sydney, was that her research for um, the, the the series was basically to buy the Loeb Classical Library or the Loeb mm -hmm. Classical Library complete. She bought the whole thing, and then she hired a an honors student to read it, and that was that was her research. And she would then. Um, you know, mine the 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 assistant that she had hired to students. read the library to to you know give her all the material that she then based her characters on. So I think there are there are passages and passages in in the novels which are which are. I read this book and here's the chunk from that book. Um, and interestingly, she was then invited to start presenting lectures at the Australian uh, classical studies society as a as a historian because of the amount of work she'd done mm. and there was there was still this was some years later there was still a kind of a a frisson between the people who thought that was a great thing because it popularized you know academic history mm. and those who didn't that you know her place was not to be presenting historical um papers because she's not a historian which i think still exists today in mm. in our world that there are there are those who write history and there are those who write fiction and those two worlds never meet. And yet I think we've all read people who are historians who really are writing fiction. And we've probably all read fiction that's very well informed as history. Um, and so that, that line again is, is not anywhere near as far apart as people would like to think it's, it's much more blurred. Yeah. People, people, people try to do this to me all the time. Uh, I'm sitting right here. I've published, uh, uh, 10 science fiction and fantasy novels with major New York houses. And my second real genuine work of historical scholarship will be coming out. I'm a novelist. 
I'm an historian and mm -hmm. nobody can take, if you want to take those titles from me, <laughs> Molan Lave. Oh, <laughs> 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 Amos, Amos and we'll defend ourselves. Scol <laughs> Socrates Scholasticus. Um, yeah. I want to put forward the I, I Iliad. I want, I want oh, to put yeah. forward the Iliad sure, yeah. as a work of ancient warfare fiction. I think it's unique in that it is a work of ancient warfare fiction that it was actually composed during the era of ancient warfare. Uh, mm. It's remarkable. It's the, the oldest surviving uh, Greek literary work. It's a masterpiece. Mm. There is uh, some thought that the Greek uh, alphabet, the, uh, which was actually based on ultimately the Phoenician alphabet, was adopted to write down mm. the Iliad. It, it's mm. attributed to Homer, who probably came up with the, the best and most popular version of this entire uh, epic poem cycle. Uh, written centuries, or I should say, written down centuries and probably composed even centuries after the uh, Trojan War that it purports to uh, uh, describe, uh, it, it really is special. And it's, it's, it's one of those things where reading it, I think that from the perspective of someone who's interested in ancient warfare, that is, and, and I think that's why this it makes so much, uh, it, it's worth discussing, is that Homer has in the Iliad I think I think it's a hodgepodge of many different eras of ancient warfare. That certainly there's something that comes from the late Bronze Age. That is the the era of the Mycenaean uh, uh, Golden Age, uh, which actually fought in the so-called Trojan War. Right. So we're dealing with something in the 13th century BC. There may be echoes to survivals from an earlier period. That is depending upon uh, you know you know uh, earlier in the uh, period the Mycenaeans fought with very long uh, spears and big shields and that's in the Iliad but also we know that they fought with uh, smaller shields and shorter spears and that also is in the Iliad uh, there are the chariots and they don't do combat in the chariots but probably uh, they battled uh, from chariots at some point uh, I think that it, it, I, if I was going to make any sort of analogy between the period when this entire poem cycle uh, arose in sub-Mycenaean or even in, during the Dark Age of, of uh, Greece. It, it, it was reminiscent to me of post-Roman Britain. That is, there were still echoes, remnants, memories of Roman Britannia, but not everything was remembered as well uh, or, or, or as fully as it could have been. I think the Iliad is a lot like that. And it, it, reading the Iliad, apart from the fact that it is a masterpiece of literature, and not just the fact that it's got you know, ancient oh. warfare in it, I think it's worth it reading because it, it do, has so much in there for the student of ancient military history to mind, to actually see what it was like, what people who fought uh, uh, would have thought about combat. Because... Homer, uh, or the, the bar, traveling bards that went around from court to court, you know, repeating this poem, they were performing for aristocratic audiences. And I think that everything in that you read in the, in the Iliad, or what they would have heard, would have had to have rung true to warriors, warlords who actually fought. That's something worthwhile. That's something worthwhile. I think that's why I think the Iliad is worth reading. Ironically, it's from the Iliad that you get, you know, a huge amount, a huge core of fictional historical writing in the modern era. I mean, the one that I was going to actually say is, um, you know, a, a recent book that's come out in the last couple of years, uh, Natalie Haynes' Thousand Ships, is uh, again a retake on the, the whole Trojan War story, but this time taking it from a different perspective of t looking at the the female um characters and their perspectives of different bits of the of the war and it's well Madeline I mean, on the one hand you've got a oh, sorry Melon Miller as well song of Achilles yeah is, you know, uh, again it's you know it's yeah something that you know you're the difference being with Natalie Haynes is that she's sort of it's it's not just going with I mean you know going back to the Iliad and it is that blend of um, the you know real and mythology uh, mythological, and Natalie Haynes is sort of taking that as well and actually taking it from you know again looking at perspectives, but actually looking at them, it, it is as a whole but also as individual 
elements of how the individual experiences a war that's going on around them or a conflict that's going on around them. Um, but as I say, it's, you know, it is a topic that everyone from, we mentioned a minute ago, Colleen McCulloch, um, with her, um, you know, her Rome series actually after that ended up doing a, a I think it was a one-off, uh, I think it was called The Song of Achilles, which is a, sto uh, a title that also shared by a couple others, I think, as well. Mm -hmm. But um, again, was a you know a decent take on again a different perspective of the Trojan War. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious always... uh, how many of you folks are aware of the new Jerusalem Post article came out a couple of days ago saying that they, they there are a couple of professors in the University of Boston who think they found the Trojan horse. So maybe yeah, it's yeah, not I saw, I saw that. All, I, did, right? I actually, oh, Lindsay. I, I amazingly Lindsay. didn't click that clickbait. I'm I'm new, usually a, a, that, that, a right. That apparently was uh, published exactly the same five years ago. Well, the same with the, the cuneiform, the same with the cuneiform uh, mathematical text, which is a new discovery, which is not. And you know, anyway, um, we're, we're getting distracted me, again in time. No, no, I was, I was, I was coming back. That was a segue. Um, yeah. I was coming back to to the interesting thing for me about uh, the the Iliad and you know Homer and his version of the Trojan War and how you know there is so much scholarship on what. And we're going to have a, a an issue of the magazine coming up um, in two issues time of Homeric warfare and what is Homeric warfare? Is it is it the warfare of this poet Homer who's writing in the mid eighth century BC, or is it the warfare of the the time that we think that the Trojan War was fought, which is still not settled according to some scholars? And the funny thing, you know, talking to people about that and how how could it be? that you've got this poem that's describing, you know, events 400, 500 years before it. And it's funny because you're sitting there and you're saying, well, it would be like writing the great Shakespeare epic poem now and that becoming people's primary source for Shakespeare. Not, you know, and in a way, all of the quotes of Homer that we get from later Roman history and Greek history would be the same as the people sh quoting and misquoting Shakespeare all over the place. But if we lost everything except for you know, the, the the poem that one of us was to write about the life of Shakespeare, that would be it. And so you'd have all these other people talking about Shakespeare and quoting Shakespeare, and then scholars in 2,000 years' time trying to reconstruct what Shakespeare we're talking about based on a poem written in the 21st century about a writer writing in the 16th century. And you're like, oh, that couldn't possibly happen. That couldn't, you're like, well, that's exactly what Homer is. You know, it's a tradition and it's a it's a single event that, you know, survives. And all of the complexities would come with that is essentially what you've got in the in the Iliad and the scholarship around the Iliad, but with a very uh, fractured way of trying to analyze it because we don't have all of the other material. Um, and that that in itself lends itself to, his, to fiction as opposed to history. Well, it's interesting you say that because the British Museum a couple of years ago, gosh, that seems an awful long time ago, the last time I went there, um, did, did a big uh, exposition about Troy. And, and the one thing that, that I think they got right was that they explored Troy through the Homeric version of it. That's to say, through the mythologizing and the characters and so on, and then try to show, here's a 5th century vase, for example, which shows the scene from Homer, where I think they got it wrong was they didn't explore, this is the Ancient Warfare podcast, they didn't explore what actually all of that meant from a historical perspective about warfare itself. But um, you're absolutely right. I, I think it's absolutely fascinating that that, that, that in a sense, has become a, an ancient world quandary, hasn't it? I mean, you know, what exactly do you believe about it? Mm. Well, look at Schliemann. You know, Schliemann's, ah. mm. uh, Who was at the you show, know, right. But, you know, Schliemann's quest was regarded as a fictional full hardy event until he found it uh and then suddenly it, it you know didn't invent archaeology but it but it certainly is in there as a as a as part of that world and yet he believed the history of the iliad and yet most people thought that the iliad was fiction and yet by finding troy and even though he misidentified which troy it was uh and even the people who don't think that his troy is troy um you know, he's he's created a real world from a fictional one by saying, I believe that the details of the poem tell us real events about real things. And so in a way, we've flipped this whole conversation that here you have a poem which was regarded as fiction by a lot of modern scholars being proved to be based on fact. And there are probably lots of other things in the ancient world that are similar, 
you know, the 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 Odyssey, for instance, you can find places and and things in that that are probably based on fact. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to in take a similar that way. Just, oh, sorry. I was just going to say about um, uh, Rosemary Sutcliffe and the Eagle of the Night, which is the young adult uh, fiction, which was one of, the, one of the first novels I ever read as, as a kid, long, long, long time ago. In fact, my confession is I had to I had to read it over a weekend, so I cheated. I read the first, I think, third, the last third, and I had to guess what happened in the middle. <laughs> Because I had to hand the novel back to my teacher on the Monday, um, but anyhow, but the point is that that started when uh, when there was a there was a discovery in Silchester, of course, of a bronze eagle, and much as the archaeology will say, well, no, that actually was at the foot of the statue of Jupiter in Silchester, Caliber Atrobatum. She then created this rather elaborate story, which of course has been made into a movie and TV shows and all sorts of audio books and whatever um, about uh, Marcus Flavius Aquila, who goes off north of the border in search of the, uh, the the lost legion of the ninth so it, it is interesting how these historical kind of nuggets can actually spin out a uh, a fictional telling i was going to say there was a book that came out a uh, while back now by uh, stoddard and um, moorhead uh, which is the the romans that shaped britain and the interesting way that they sort of write it is that they start off every chapter uh, with a a fictional telling of a particular key incident from their narrative, etc., and then of course they sort of then you know once you're sort of being given this nice flowing fictional account, they then go back and analyse it as it you know in its correct context and whatnot. So again, you know, a similar way to what Murray's sort of saying: take the take the fiction and then build upon it to get the history. Well, the I think we're going to right now, Murray. I think we're going to because time is flying. I think we're going to disappoint people a lot who want to just get some recommendations for their beach reading. So, Murray, you first. Uh, one uh, title. One oh, one author, Mary Renault. Anything right. by Mary Renault. Good, Mark. Uh, Mark McGaffrey. Uh, in terms of recent stuff, I'd say Natalie Haynes in uh, A Thousand Ships and also The Children of Eucasta, retelling the uh, the Greek myths. Mark DeSantis, do you want to do The Iliad? The, the Iliad uh, by Homer. Uh, I hear he's working on a sequel. <laughs> Odysseus, they say, is the breakout star of the Iliad that he's getting his own his own book. So try him out. Maybe it'll be movies someday. Maybe. Spike. Mike. What would you uh, recommend? I, I'll, 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 I'll grab two just because they're Ameri great American authors, or rather one American author, one British, would be Robert Graves, Count Belisarius, and Gore Vidal's Julian. Lindsay? Yes, the one I recommended, which is Wall Spring, Eagle in the Snow. Um, that definitely, I think, it's uh, set in the winter, so if you're sitting on a hot beach, that will that'll be an interesting tonic. Um, and also Marguerite Yocanard, the memoir, Memoirs of Hadrian. All right, I'll add uh, Christian Cameron, the Tyrant series, because oh. it's just properly bloody. Um, and that was it, I think. I'll talk to you again soon. Bye. Good reading. Thank you.